Hello, and welcome back to Felity Spectator. I am your host, Heather. Today, we're talking about the Snowtown murders, also referred to as the case of the bodies in the barrels. This took place in Snowtown, Australia, by three men who basically just killed for fun. If you haven't heard of this case, it's very graphic and could be very upsetting to some of you. But let's get right in. John Bunting was born September 1966 in Inala, Queensland, which is a suburb in Brisbane. He was an only child whose parents loved him dearly. He was said to be a pretty good kid. He had a strict schedule as a younger child, but it worked for him. He liked routine and it just worked really well. And as he grew up, he also tended to stick to the rules. He was really easy to get along with and had loads of friends. But then in 1974, during a summer heat wave, he would go to a friend's house to play in their basement to escape the heat. This friend had an older teenage brother that was a known bully. And this older brother had come home to find the boys playing in the basement and basically just started to torment the young kids. Before John even knew what was happening, the older brother had sucker punched him, knocking him out. The teenage brother also beat up John's friend and would turn back to John and beat him further before brutally raping him and tying him up. Sadly, when the teenager was done, he would leave the house and return a short time later with three friends who all took turns with John raping and beating him. When John was finally allowed to go home an hour after curfew, his mother punished him for being late. She was furious that he didn't tell her where he was, and she was worried sick. Now, John didn't tell his mom what happened, and I'm telling you because this incident is what changed John forever. He went from being a happy kid who followed the rules to then failing school and being angry most of the time. Now, not only did he not tell his mother, he didn't tell anybody what happened. Instead, he just kept it inside, and it would just slowly emotionally destroy him. One of his interests in school was chemistry, and he would take that knowledge he learned in class and make strong chemicals to dissolve insects at home. Hurting these insects felt good. He was able to take his anger out on another living thing, but unfortunately it progressed to him taking his anger out on other living things like the neighborhood cats and dogs. While skipping school one day, John would meet an older gentleman who was a white supremacist. This person also hated gay people, disabled people, addicts, and homeless people, basically everyone but himself. John was intrigued by this person, and they'd soon become friends. John would continue to skip school so he could hang out with this man, and I believe they both would catch neighborhood dogs and torture them for fun. As the years went on, torturing cats and dogs wasn't enough, so they would start to lure gay men and beat them up. Now, in order to lure these gay men, John would have to pretend to be gay himself and allow these men to hit on him. He would then walk them down dark alleys or secluded areas with false promises of sexual acts, but instead, his friend was waiting to beat them up. And pretending to be gay was really upsetting to John because of what happened to him as a child. So he would get angry each time and would also join in in beating these people up. By the age of 16, John had gotten a girl pregnant. When she found out she was pregnant, she decided she didn't want anything to do with John, but he wanted to do his best to provide for his child, do the right thing. He probably saw this as an opportunity to love something unconditionally and maybe change his life. He got a job at the crematorium so he could make money for the baby. He would tell people he didn't mind working at the crematorium because the dead bodies didn't bother him. And as a bonus, he would also steal gold fillings out of the deceased for extra money. When his baby was finally born, the mother informed him that she was moving to England with their child and she told him never to try and find them and they were never gonna see each other again. And this was crushing to John. He was really excited to be a father and now that was never gonna happen. Also around that same time, his friend who helped him with hate crimes also died. After that, John took a road trip to Adelaide with some friends to start fresh. The group of friends all found apartments and got jobs. John would share an apartment with another couple and got a job in a slaughterhouse in the meatpacking district. And he was good at this job. He had good knife skills and also enjoyed it. He also strangely bragged about it in a sick kind of way, telling people how much he loved cutting up animals. Now, John tried to be good for a while and was said to be charming when he wanted to be. 
He also took up metalwork, stayed employed, and even met a girl. But he would soon become restless and bored with his day-to-day -day life. John was also still a really angry person deep down. His roommates at one point had adopted a dog, and this dog hated John. It must have sensed that he was a bad person because it was constantly growling and barking at him. And John equally hated the dog. So one night when John came home from work and no one else was home, he would go out and get his blowtorch and torture the dog for hours with this blowtorch until it died. I don't believe John came out and admitted to killing the dog, but his roommates suspected he was responsible and they would kick him out of the apartment. So John and his now wife would move to Bunting, Australia. It was here that he met his neighbor, Robert Wagner. Robert was also a kid with a very troubling background. Robert was horribly abused by his father and his mother did very, very little to protect him or make him feel loved. When he was just 13, he tried to escape the abuse he was getting at home by hanging out with an ex-inmate named Barry Lane, who had recently been released from prison for abusing two 12-year-old boys. By most accounts, Barry was a cross-dresser, but in today's day and age, he would probably be considered trans. Barry would eventually change his name to Vanessa as he preferred being a female. Now, Barry basically groomed Robert. He was very kind to him and made him feel very safe and loved. They their relationship would turn sexual even though Barry was a grown adult and Robert was only 13. Sadly, Robert didn't see that this relationship was a problem. To him, it was consensual. Robert quite often ran away from home to live with Barry and get away from all of his problems at home. So you can only imagine how mentally broken Robert was to view this ex-prisoner who was essentially sexually assaulting him as a so-called partner. They also had a massive age gap and nothing about the situation was normal. Robert's parents basically gave up on Robert and allowed him to live with Barry even though they knew what was happening. So Robert and Barry would continue living together for years as a couple. Since Barry changed his name to Vanessa, we'll call him Vanessa, and Barry would be Robert's fiance as well. John had also befriended Robert around this time as well. Now this was mostly a one-sided friendship. John was smart and Robert wasn't. Robert was illiterate, had a low IQ, and was obviously quite emotionally damaged. But Robert looked up to John and their friendship would become quite close. John even tolerated Robert's fiance, Barry, also known as Vanessa even though he hated gay men and pedophiles. But Robert was easy to manipulate, so they would go hang out together and they would consider each other friends. And this was John's thing. He would befriend those he thought that he could control. Now, I'm not sure he ever truly wanted friendship. He wanted to feel powerful and have control over other people which isn't surprising since he suffered that one horrific incident when he was eight of being raped by his friend's brother. He didn't have any control of that situation and it broke him. Now, Vanessa, Barry, sort of knew this and she would highly enjoy pushing John's buttons and making him feel uncomfortable. She would be extra flamboyant at times and would touch John's arm knowing that he hated it and made flirty comments just to get under his skin. John tolerated this strictly for Robert. Another friend they made was Clinton Trezice. Clinton was more friends with Robert. He was said to be a friendly person. He liked to dress nice and was overall happy. Clinton wasn't so easy to control and this bothered John. John was the ringleader of the group and it drove him crazy. Clinton also didn't engage in John's rants about pedophiles or hatreds of certain type of people. Instead, he changed the subject and try and keep the conversations light. John often called Clinton happy pants because he was one of the more positive ones in the group. But Clinton's positivity just rubbed John the wrong way. And misery loves company after all, so Clinton wasn't really welcome according to John. One day in August of 1992, when John, Robert, and his fiance, Vanessa Lane, and Clinton were all hanging out, John would finally snap. John was already in a bad mood because Vanessa was being her extra flamboyant self, touching John's arm and bothering him. She could see it was pissing him off and she was loving it. Now, as much as John wanted to hurt Vanessa, he knew he couldn't because of Robert. So instead, he took it out on Clinton. First, John tried to get a rise from Clinton, but when Clinton ignored him, John lost it. 
He started to call Clinton a child molester and other things that just weren't true. So John would walk out of the room, grab a shovel, and hit Clinton across the face with it. Clinton's skull basically shattered and he fell to the floor. John took a few more swings at his head and then turned to Vanessa and said, fuck you to her. Now, Robert was apparently horrified by what happened. He'd never see someone beat to death before, but Vanessa being an ex-con was a little more desensitized to the situation. She knew that they now had to go along with whatever John said, or they could either be next or go to prison. So their only option was to work together to clean the apartment and dispose of Clinton. Sadly, Clinton's family didn't report him missing until three years later. They assumed that he just picked up and had moved away. Over the next year, John went back to torturing and killing animals. And that behavior is typically done during adolescence, but not with John. He needed to torture something. He just couldn't go about his life not being angry and taking that anger out on something or someone else. John also started to have affairs on his wife, and one of them was with Elizabeth Harvey. Elizabeth was newly divorced from a very abusive relationship, and due to being abused, she thought John was amazing. John also hit it off with her oldest son, James Flasakis. James was mostly referred to as Jamie by his friends and family, but we'll call him James because we're not friends. James too had a troubling past and most of it was kept a secret from his mother, Elizabeth. He was physically and sexually abused by his stepbrother and father, which created an angry and resentful person. On top of that, he also suffered from schizophrenia. John could see how broken this boy was. So he decided to sort of take James under his wing and started to treat James as his own son. And this suited James well. He needed a father figure in his life and would soon do almost anything to impress John. He was very easily manipulated. So after a year of being with Elizabeth and treating James as a son, John finally admitted to the affair to his wife. Some accounts say that his wife Veronica stayed for a while, but other accounts say that she left and John moved out with Elizabeth and James. Now, Elizabeth Harvey was infatuated with John. She doted on him, and John could do nothing wrong in her eyes. And if he did, she'd make excuses and justified his behavior because this was the best man she had ever been with. And same with James. He looked at John like this father he never had. John was on a very high pedestal in their eyes. John would soon start to teach James how to catch dogs and cats in the neighborhood to kill. And James went along with it because he didn't want to disappoint John, his new hero. James would start to join in skinning cats and they enjoyed the sick and twisted hobby together. Then Clinton's body would be found August 16th, 1994. Police didn't have very much luck trying to figure out what happened to Clinton because he was kind of a loner. It was a mystery as to why anyone would want to hurt Clinton. And there were no clues or leads that they could go on. When the news reported the findings of Clinton, John proudly said to James and Elizabeth that he did it. He got rid of him, who was a pedophile, and Elizabeth said, good for you. And it was then that John realized he could move on from killing animals and take James out to hunt humans instead. Now, I should point out that there was no proof that Clinton was a pedophile. It was just something John said to justify what he did. What John did next is almost out of a movie. He made it his mission to rid the world of sex offenders or people he thought needed to die. So he would get names out of Vanessa Lane through conversations they had about other ex-inmates or people on the streets that she knew to be shady. So John created this wall in his home with photos, names, addresses, phone numbers, and connect them with threads of wool or red string. And this is what John referred to as his rock spider wall. Now, John had no proof as to what crimes many of these people committed or if they were actually sex offenders, but it didn't matter. To John, they were all evil. They were all the teenagers who raped him as a child. Now, John didn't kill all of them, but most of them he did torment. Sometimes he called them on the phone, telling them to just kill themselves and accusing them of horrific crimes. And most of these people didn't report the harassment to police because they were ex-inmates. The police probably wouldn't have taken them seriously. One person on John's list of people he needed to get rid of was Ray Davies. Ray was a 27-year-old mentally disabled man who lived in a trailer behind the house of a woman named Susan Allen. Some would say he was a bit of a busybody, 
he would run out of his trailer he rented from Susan anytime he heard a noise outside. This trailer was parked on Susan Allen's property, and he paid her rent to live in this trailer. It's said that one time he ran out of the trailer after he thought he heard something suspicious. Susan's grandkids came running into the house screaming that they saw him fully naked. So I guess he was naked when he ran outside. But rumors started circulating in the neighborhood that Ray did this on purpose because he wanted the kids to see him naked. This rumor also morphed into Ray trying to force himself on these boys. Now, Susan and John were friends, and Susan had vented her frustration to John about how Ray made advances on her grandsons. She ended up telling John a version of the story that supported John's suspicions that Ray did it on purpose to expose himself to the boys. Now, Susan liked John more than just a friend. So during this conversation, Susan and John also slept together, and that solidified everything for John. Ray needed to go, and he was going to do this for Susan. So John, Robert, and James dragged Ray out of bed one night back to John's house, where John would beat Ray with a cricket bat. John had also beat Ray's testicles so much that they almost fell off. James also took turns beating Ray as well, and they also attached jumper cables to him to attempt to electrocute him and torture him. Elizabeth was there as well and justified the beating. She knew deep down that her son was damaged because of abuse, so beating a pedophile was fine with her. She even stabbed Ray as well in the leg with some sort of tool. When they were done, Ray would be buried in their backyard. Now, Ray was never reported missing, but witnesses would later say that they saw John and Robert cleaning the trailer, which seemed a bit odd. John and Elizabeth had moved to Murray Bridge not long after, but John made sure to go back to Adelaide to see Susan because they were still having an affair. It also turns out that Ray used to get his government assistance checks mailed to Susan's address. So it's most likely that John was using Susan for that money. And this went on for some time until Susan suddenly disappeared. John has always denied killing Susan. However, he did dismember her. He would claim that he found her already dead, maybe from a heart attack or drugs. But since he didn't want to be tied to her, he would dig up Ray's grave at his old house and added her in the grave before covering everything up. John had also somehow managed to get Susan's bank information because he wanted to continue to get Ray's checks, and now he also could get Susan's checks as well. Now, Susan was reported missing, and the police noted that Susan's home looked like it had been completely ransacked, which was unusual for her. Her pets were also all left behind, so it didn't seem like she just packed up and left because there was no evidence otherwise. So she was labeled a missing person. Another friend who hung out with the group and was starting to hang out more and more was Mark Hayden. Mark was a strong but quiet man, and he was mostly friends with John. Mark was married to a woman also named Elizabeth who had eight kids by different men. Now, John hated Mark's wife. She was an outspoken woman and not easily influenced by John's fake charm. And the feelings were mutual. She didn't like John and she complained about him all the time. I believe she also wanted Mark to stop being friends with John, so this caused tension in their marriage. John knew that Elizabeth wanted him gone, so John tried to solve this problem by befriending her sister Jody and then befriending her disabled son, Fred Brooks. He did this because John needed Mark in his life and he didn't want a Elizabeth to win. Mark was the money man. He used his bank accounts to money launder all the government checks and stolen money from John's victims. So if John made sure he was friends with people in Elizabeth's circle, she wouldn't be able to get rid of him so easily. Now, the men thought they had so much money coming into the account that it was time to find a new way to launder it, as they didn't want to raise any suspicion. In reality, these checks coming in weren't really all that much, but I guess to people who are used to being poor or on welfare, it seemed like a lot. Mark suggested renting an unoccupied building in Snowtown, which was once used as a bank. John thought the building was perfect for him to do his criminal activities in, and it was a four enough that he could easily pay the rent at around $60 a week. The rental contract would also be put into Mark's name because John didn't want to be tied to it if things went sideways. 
John decided that this building would be where he would dispose of bodies. He was smart enough to know that if there was no bodies, there was no crime. Now remember that John was really into science back in school and disintegrated insects from chemicals. So John felt that he was confident enough that he could do that now with the humans that he killed. He would buy substances to make what he thought was powerful acids. He also got dozens of large barrels and put them in the basement of the building for his future victims. Another victim was Michael Gardiner. Michael also went by the name Michelle and had become a friend of Robert's. Michael was a flamboyant 19-year-old gay man, but would later change his name to Michelle as he became trans. Michelle had isolated herself from her family because they didn't approve of her sexuality. She was also abused by a family member and put into foster care when she was still Michael. So she wanted to put that life behind her and live her life as Michelle. By September of 1997, she was coming to terms with who she was and really starting to grow into herself. She rented a room from a woman named Nicole nearby John's place. Nicole and Michelle had a special bond because Nicole never judged her and accepted her for who she was. Nicole would paint Michelle's nails, she helped her pick out wigs, and I believe it was Nicole who actually started to call her Michelle instead of Michael. Nicole's cousin Vicky also lived in the neighborhood and was dating Robert. By this time, Robert and Vanessa, Barry Lane, were broken up. Robert and Michelle soon became acquaintances through Vicky. So one day Michelle's playing with Vicky's kids and they were all running around having a good time when Michelle went to grab one of the kids and inadvertently covered the child's mouth with her hand. And this was very triggering to Robert. To him, it looked like something more. So Robert would inform John of this incident and John agreed that something had to be done. It was also known that Michelle collected government checks. So John thought Michelle would be the perfect next victim. So one day when Michelle's landlady, Nicole, was on holiday, John, Robert, and Mark kidnapped Michelle. The men also roughed up the house and stole some of Nicole's belongings to try and make it look like Michelle robbed Nicole and left. This time, Robert would take the lead beating Michelle because he was so triggered by Michelle grabbing Vicky's child. Robert was really messed up from everything that he experienced as a kid and a teen. He hated that he fell for Barry Lane, for years had a twisted sense that Barry was taking care of him and not abusing him. He was angry and he took it all out on Michelle. Michelle would also be electrocuted, beat, and then choked to death before being put in a barrel in the shed behind Mark's house. The one thing they forgot when they kidnapped Michelle was her wallet. And this was important because John wanted Nicole, his landlord, to think that Michelle had skipped town, but people don't skip town without their wallet. They also wanted to get her checks sent to Mark, so they needed a plan to try and get the wallet from Michelle's landlord. Remember Mark's wife, Elizabeth, John had befriended her disabled nephew, Fred Brooks. Well, John decided to get Fred Brooks to pretend to be Michelle's new boyfriend and ask for the wallet. So he called Nicole and claimed that they moved away together and she needed her SIN card to reroute her government check. Unfortunately, it didn't work at first and Nicole refused to hand it over without speaking to Michelle first. Nicole also wanted Michelle to bring her stuff back that was stolen. Now this went on for a little while, but Nicole did eventually give in and give the wallet to James, who still often spoke with Nicole in person. But Nicole was still very suspicious and would report the incident to the police. She just couldn't believe that Michelle would just move away, steal her things, and refuse to speak to her. During all of this, Barry, or Vanessa, was starting to get scared. He started to put two and two together and realized that he was being used for information and he was starting to feel bad about it because everyone he talked to John about ended up missing or dead. Now, Barry still couldn't turn to police, though, because he was an ex-prisoner and involved in Clinton's death. He didn't want to end up in jail. And John knew Barry was getting nervous and made sure to torment him to keep him quiet. But then Barry met a man named Thomas Trevilian. Thomas was also a gay man who was obsessed with the military and dressed mostly in military uniforms. He acted tough, but he wasn't actually in the army due to having mental illness. Now, despite not being in the army, he still acted like he was. He carried a knife, he kept fit for combat, and dressed in the attire. So one day, Barry had invited him over for a drink in 1997, and they hit it off. So Thomas would move into Barry's home, and he was basically his unofficial boyfriend bodyguard. So Barry started to feel safe again and trusted Thomas. 
So one night, Barry opened up and told Thomas all about Clinton and Michelle. Now remember, Thomas was mentally ill himself, and learning this information was upsetting. So he shared the information, and this rumor was leaked, and word got back to John. Now, I don't know how John convinced Thomas to join his little gang, but one night, Robert, John, and Thomas went over to Barry's to talk. Now, during their talk, Barry said he didn't want to be the person to give John information anymore. He didn't want any part of John and his gang, and he was done. When the conversation ended, Thomas would lean over and choke Barry, dragging him to the phone where they made him call his mother. Barry would be forced to tell his mother that he was moving away to Queensland and he didn't want to talk to her anymore. She unfortunately believed him because they never really had a great relationship. She would later say that she may have heard someone in the background telling him what to say, but she didn't notice it at the time. Robert, again, would be the one to take over this torture. He was going to take all his anger out on Barry by electrocuting, beating, crushing his toes with pliers because Barry was the person who groomed him as a young boy and convinced him that the abuse was love. Robert also got Barry's financial details before they finished him off. Barry would be put in the same barrel as Michelle, which was still in the back of Mark's shed. One of Barry's girlfriends reported him missing after about 10 days. And she also tells the police that Barry revealed the murder of Clinton to her, but he was too scared to go to the police. Police spoke with Barry's mother, who confirmed that he actually moved away, so police didn't really follow up on the case at all. Now that Barry was dead, Thomas since moved in with Robert and Vicky. And Robert realized that Thomas was very emotionally unstable and seemed to be on the verge of a mental breakdown. It said that Thomas had a really hard time living with what happened to Barry and his involvement. There's also reports that he told a cousin about Barry, so John and Robert knew that he had to go next. He was too much of a liability. And at this point, Thomas was so mentally strained that all they needed to do was drive him to the Adelaide Hills, had him stand on a box and put a noose around his neck to stage a suicide. And Thomas basically went along with the entire thing, not resisting. Thomas would be found a month later, but police felt there was no reason to follow up with anything because it looked like an obvious suicide. James would also start to distance himself from John and had become a heroin addict. He still lived at the home with Elizabeth and John, but just spended less time with John. It's assumed he turned to heroin to stop the nightmares that started since being involved in John's gang and killing people. Now, John hated addicts almost as much as he hated pedophiles, but he looked at James like a son, so he let it slide and allowed James to continue living at the home. One day, James brought Gavin Porter home, a friend who was also an addict. Gavin needed a place to stay, and he was homeless, so James let him crash on the couch. Now, of course, John didn't want him there, but he allowed it mainly not to upset James. He didn't want to push James away because James held all of these secrets and was part of his little gang. Gavin was also schizophrenic like James, and he too collected a government pension. So it's probable that John planned to eventually take his money. One day when John came home and sat down on the couch, he was stabbed by one of Gavin's needles. John was infuriated and would call Robert to tell him to get rid of Gavin once and for all. Instead of allowing Robert to kick him out of the house, they killed him instead. After John and Robert murdered Gavin, they brought him to the shed at the back of the house. When James returned home later, John would bring James out to the shed to show them his friend. Now, James couldn't show his fear, and he ended up helping John by taking the barrels of dead bodies to the Snowtown Bank. John would pour his chemical concoction over the bodies to dissolve them. James would then be told to get rid of Gavin's car and his belongings. James didn't want to upset John and still sort of looked at him like a father, so he just did what he was told. And John really took advantage of being this father figure and really made sure James stayed angry for all the abuse he endured by the hands of his own father. What also happened to James was that his father invited his stepbrother, Troy Yude, to also abuse him when they were young. Now, I'm sure Troy was also being abused. Not that that's an excuse for him to abuse James, but he was probably being controlled by his dad, who he feared. Now, James probably didn't realize that Troy was being controlled, and to him, Troy was just a monster like his father. 
In 1998, Elizabeth had asked John if Troy could move in. Troy was now 21 and needed a place to live. And John said yes, even though he knew what Troy did to James. John welcomed Troy to their home, even offering James bedroom. Some reports say that Troy never actually lived there because John, James, and Robert and Mark woke him up the first night he moved in. Other reports say that he lived there for a little while, but both accounts say he was woken up in the middle of the night and removed from the home. This time it was James who got to take his revenge out on his stepbrother who caused him so much pain. Troy would be forced to speak into a tape recorder giving his financial details. The men had also kept the recorder on, which would later be found by police, showing that the gang had him refer to them as God, Master, or Chief Inspector. They crushed his toes with pliers if he forgot to address them correctly, and he too was electrocuted and tortured. James would be responsible for dismembering Troy, further taking out his rage on his body before bringing him to Snowtown Bank. Meanwhile, Mark's wife was starting to question Mark about their finances and where all this money was coming from and going to. Now remember, Mark was responsible to launder all this money from the victims, and he was using his own bank accounts. Now Mark would tell John that his wife had started to question him, and John wanted to take care of her. Now, Mark didn't want his wife dead, so they made a new plan. This plan was to get rid of her sister Jody's disabled son, Fred Brooks. Now, remember, Fred helped getting Michelle's wallet from Nicole, so he also could be looked at as a liability because he knew things he wasn't supposed to know. But by killing Fred, they thought it would also scare Mark's wife. Maybe she'd stop asking questions if someone close to her disappeared as well. So a month after they took Troy's life, Fred was next. Now, for some reason, they also tortured Fred just like everyone else, even though he hadn't done anything wrong. He wasn't a perceived pedophile. He wasn't a drug addict. He wasn't someone up on John's spider rock wall. He was simply related to Mark's wife. They put lit cigarettes in his ears, used a lighter and burned a happy face into his own face, they electrocuted his genitals and other awful things. About a month later, John and James together would spot Gary O'Dwyer. Gary was 29 and was disabled due to a car accident in his early 20s. This accident gave him permanent brain damage and he was left intellectually disabled. Due to this, he became a bit of a hermit. He minded his own business, wasn't a bother, but he also didn't have any friends. As far as I know, these men didn't have any connection to Gary, and he was just spotted one day and they thought he'd be an easy target. So James would befriend Gary and learn that he lived alone and also collected government subsidy. And Gary seemed to enjoy James's company. So James would visit almost daily, gathering information for John and building Gary's trust. One day, James, Robert, and John would go to Gary's for drinks. John tried to get Gary drunk, but Robert got impatient. So after about 20 minutes of their visit, Robert would start to choke Gary. The men sadly tortured Gary just like all the other victims and had him repeat his financial information into a tape recorder as well. Gary was also placed into a barrel. At this point, there's about 10 victims and enough money that John's group were very comfortable financially. This also meant that Elizabeth, Mark's wife, would start questioning again. She also complained about John all the time and suspected he was up to something bad because he had no job but always had money. John started to fear that she would go to the police because she had access to the financial statements. Now, Elizabeth would never blame Mark, her husband, but she hated John, so she'd easily point the finger at him if she decided to go to the police. He also suspected she somehow knew about her nephew's murder, even though she didn't have proof. It was when Elizabeth asked about the Snowtown bank rental did John make his final decision that she needed to go. She was starting to put the pieces together. John and Robert would surprise Elizabeth on November 21st, 1998, when Mark was out of the house during an afternoon. Some reports say, out of respect for Mark, they didn't torture her, only strangled her, but others say that she too was tortured. Mark did come home and see Elizabeth dead on the floor and would start to cry. Some reports say that he laughed and didn't care that they killed his wife. 
She too would be placed in a barrel kept at Mark's house temporarily. The following day, Elizabeth was supposed to meet her brother, Garion. When she didn't show up, Garion thought this was very out of character for Elizabeth. He tried to get a hold of her, but Garion would report her missing on November 25th of 1998 which was something John didn't count on. Up until this point, the police had no idea that they even had serial killers on their hands. The killers and their victims seemed to fly under the radar of police just due to the fact that these people were all loners. Nobody noticed or even cared that some of these victims were missing. And this often happens in lower income communities. They often don't have families or a lot of friends or support system. So when they go missing, nobody really notices or they assume that that person moved away. Police also often put less time into solving cases where there isn't family to push them. But this time there was family. Garion would push the police to look into his sister's disappearance. Police would inquire with Mark as to where his wife went and Mark said that after a heated argument, she just left. He didn't know where she went. Garion didn't buy that for a second. When police were at Mark's home, there was no evidence left behind. Now, even though they didn't have evidence yet, police had already started an investigation on Robert a month earlier. Now, remember Clinton? Well, police had slowly chipped away at trying to figure out who had killed him. Originally, they suspected Barry Lane, but then Barry disappeared. They also learned that Barry, Robert, and Clinton were often together. The common denominator of the three men was Robert. Then when Elizabeth disappeared and was also linked to Robert, pieces started to come together. Meanwhile, Mark was becoming depressed. He was feeling sorry that his wife had to die, and he was also stressed because police had come with a search warrant and looked through his house. Police didn't find anything, but they did notice a foul odor. Unfortunately, police had just missed seeing barrels of bodies in Mark's shed. The barrels were moved on a land cruiser just as they began the investigation, and all the barrels had been moved to a friend's property, Angela Breach and Darren Freeman. When the friends later testified, they denied knowing anything and said, when the barrels began to smell badly, John informed them that there was kangaroo carcasses in them and he took them away. Now John's solution to cheer up Mark was another murder. Their next person would be David Johnson. David was a stepbrother to James. David wasn't abused by their father and never partook in any of the abuse like Troy. And James never understood why he was chosen to take all the abuse, but the other siblings weren't. James never hated David, but there was some resentment. David also lived a relatively normal life and grew up normal where James was anything but normal. Even though James resented David, they got along. James was still kind to him, but in John's eyes, that wouldn't do. John would make fun of David and ridicule their relationship. He'd also rub it in that David was successful and James was a junkie. Over time, James would eventually start to believe that maybe John was right and maybe he too wasn't worthy of being alive. One day, David called James and mentioned he needed a new computer. And John saw this as the perfect opportunity to trick David and lure him to the bank. James would make up a story about knowing a guy who was selling a computer for a really good deal, and David fell for it. He probably suspected his criminal brother was bringing him to a place to buy a stolen computer, but he trusted that James would keep him safe and protect him, and he'd get a new computer out of it. So on May 9th, 1999, James brought David to the Snowtown Bank to see a man about a computer. When they arrived, James James would lead David through the abandoned offices to where the rest of the gang waited. David was immediately choked and handcuffed before being forced to read a script that was recorded on an old computer. They would have David say that he was moving away and that he was gay and a pedophile. John also asked for David's PIN number for his bank card and sent Robert and James to clean out his bank account. David was smart though and had given them the wrong PIN number. So the transaction was canceled and didn't go through. While Robert and James were gone, John allowed Mark to begin torturing David. John wanted Mark to take his rage out on him, all the pent up anger he had from losing Elizabeth, his wife. When James and Robert returned, Robert was pissed that they completed this torture and death without him. The torture was what Robert looked forward to the most. And he was also angry that David had given them the wrong pin number. So now they weren't even getting money out of this. John assured Robert that Mark needed to do this. In turn, 
Robert could help dismember the body. During the dismemberment, someone came up with the idea that they should cook pieces of David and eat him. I believe it was Robert who cut a large chunk of flesh off his body. One of the men cooked the meat at the kitchenette in the Snowtown Bank, and John and Robert had a meal together, washing it down with some beers. Now, the disappearance into Elizabeth Hayden was still in full effect. Surveillance had been put on Mark's home phone and cell phone, and police may have heard James trying to lure David to the Snowtown Bank. Garion would also point out to police that Mark didn't have a job, yet he was able to afford a lot of things, including living in a decent neighborhood. Garion insisted that the investigators look into their financial statements, and the investigators did. They would see that there was a rent payment for the old bank building in Snowtown. Just days after David was murdered, the police got a tip that a land cruiser had been seen going to Snowtown with barrels in the back, and these barrels were loaded into the old bank. Police would let themselves into the bank and they saw lots of footprints in the dust leading them to an office with a computer. When police turned on the computer, out of curiosity, they'd find some old audio files. Here they would hear the unedited confession of David with the voices of men threatening him in the background. Other accounts say that this computer was actually at John's home and not the bank, but either way, there was recordings and there was also a notebook found with the script that many of the victims were forced to read. The police would investigate deeper into the bank and in the vault, they'd come across a very strong stench, a dozen barrels too heavy to move, filled with something. One of the officers popped the lid off a barrel, which exposed pieces of a dismembered body swimming in a strange chemical liquid. Now, John was pretty confident that the investigators wouldn't be able to pin him for anything. Maybe fraud, but not murder. He was sure that the chemicals he used to dissolve the dismembered bodies worked well enough that police wouldn't be able to identify who they were. Unfortunately for John, his high school knowledge of chemistry wasn't that great because he ended up using the wrong mixtures and basically preserving the bodies instead of dissolving them. Coroners were able to see every cut, bruise, and burn on the bodies and how each of those injuries were inflicted because they were so well preserved. They were also able to determine approximately how long each body had been dead for. All the men would be arrested right away. After John was arrested, the investigators were able to match the tools John had in his home to the injuries the victims had. Now, while the men were locked up before the trial, Elizabeth Harvey, James's mother and John's wife, had passed away. She was dying of cancer, but had kept that a secret. John and James had no idea. Her death made James very upset, and he realized that now he had nobody left in his life. His mother was really the only person in the world who loved him, and now she was gone. He also realized that the man he looked up to as a father, John, had also manipulated him, just like everybody else in his life. John had isolated him, used him for his own gain, and made him do horrible things. With his mother gone, he had nobody left to disappoint, so he wanted to confess to the police and tell them everything. James would cut a deal with the prosecution. He would plead guilty and give them a full detailed account of what happened in exchange for his physical identity to be protected from media. No photos, no courtroom sketches, no physical description. He also led detectives to the location of two bodies buried in the backyard of his old residence. James would still be given life in prison with the possibility of parole after 26 years. That means he's eligible for parole in the year 2025 in just two years from now. John, Robert, and Mark all pled not guilty to their charges. John really thought he was ridding the world of evil and justified what he did. He was quoted saying, quote, they were the disease and we were the cure, end quote. On the stand, he also downplayed what they did and referred to the torture as playing. Robert would eventually change his plea to guilty of killing three people, but would be convicted to seven counts and got 10 consecutive life sentences with no parole. Robert has since begged the courts to be released so he can spend time with his son, who was 18 months old when he was locked up. This has been denied. Mark didn't take responsibility in the killings originally. He claimed he was there behind the scenes, but responsible for the fraud. He would eventually confess to assisting in the murder of Troy and his wife. He would be sentenced to 25 years in jail, but wouldn't be able to apply for parole for 18 years. 
He will be released next year in May of 2024. John was convicted of 11 counts of murder and given 11 consecutive sentences without parole, which excluded Susan Allen. John claimed he didn't kill her and there was no proof to counter that claim. Whether or not that's the truth, we will never know. In the year 2000, a woman named Cherilee Riddle bought the bank for $34,000 with the intention of turning it into a tourist attraction, but not focusing on the murders. She once mentioned making the vault a garden and putting in a skylight. She also mentioned a bed and breakfast, but something tasteful that wouldn't draw the wrong crowd to Snowtown. I don't believe she opened anything as far as a tourist attraction, and she just lived in it instead. It was sold again in 2005, then 2006 and in 2012 went up for auction on eBay, but eBay removed the auction after 24 hours. It did eventually sell in 2012 for 190,000 and those owners just lived in it like a regular house as well. It looks like it's now operating as a souvenir shop as per Google Street View, but I can't find if it's registered as anything official. My thoughts? This is one of the more disturbing cases I have researched. There's so much torture, abuse, and manipulation, and it just kind of makes me hate people. At the beginning of the episode, we talked about how John was abused and went from being a good kid to a bad kid. And it makes me wonder if that abuse didn't happen, what he would have turned into. Now, all of these men were abused or suffered some sort of major childhood trauma. Many were also on medication for mental illnesses. You can argue that abuse doesn't make people evil, and I agree with that. There are lots of people who become productive members of society who lived through terrible childhoods, but it's more likely that if you've suffered a bad childhood, you won't be a successful adult. And there's no way for us to know how a child is gonna handle their trauma. Now, I'm not making excuses for John. I really do think what he did was absolutely horrendous and he deserves to be in jail or worse, but I still can't help but wonder if he would have been a normal person. We need to protect our children at all costs. We need to make sure they get professional help if something does happen to them. I'd love to know what you think of this case and if you have any other information about this case that I've left out. That's it for today. Thanks again for joining me here at Felony Spectator and we will see you again soon.